Whenever you say something bad about a speaker, you typically get the owners of the speaker coming out of the woodwork to tell you you're an idiot and you can't hear. Okay, so I'm an idiot and I probably can't hear. But the Jamo S803 at 150 bucks per pair being a speaker that a lot of people are interested in because it's a budget speaker is pretty bad. If you're offended by that statement, check yourself, take a breather. I'm gonna tell you why the speaker is not as good as it could be. And we're gonna talk about some options that you can look at around that same price that I believe are gonna be a better performer for your money. The Jomo S803, it epitomizes, epitomizes a V-curve. It's got a lot of bass boost around 100 hertz to 80 hertz. So when you fire them up the first time, you're going to be like, oh, wow, man, that bass is tight and taut and punchy and all this pace, rhythm and timing brat that people like to talk about. Mm, then you listen to it for a little bit longer and then you start to notice the vocals sound really full like this. It's because it's very resonant in the lower male registers and some female registers as well. And it's really quite grating after a little bit, not even after a little bit after a few minutes, not even after a few minutes, after a few seconds. The high frequency is about 5 dB in level above the mid range. Now, what does that mean? Uh, 5 dB, who knows what 5 dB means? Well, 10 dB is about twice as loud. That doesn't really help you. You gotta hear in between that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my voice as I'm talking right now, I'm gonna run it through some post-processing and audacity. I'm gonna boost the high frequency by 5 dB. You tell me what the difference is, you hear it as I'm talking, it's going on right now. I'm saying words that are really cool, it's plus 5 dB, it's still that way, now I'm gonna drop it back down to normal and I'm gonna keep talking like this from now on. So that's gonna make the mid-range sound kind of muffled. You're not really gonna hear a lot of great dialogue, not a lot of great clarity in the mid-range. Now the high frequencies, they're gonna sound like, and there's going to be a lot of ah, air to it. But that's not a neutral speaker. It might be, if not the furthest tied for the furthest or really right up there with the furthest from a neutral speaker. So if you're looking for something that provides you with neutral tone and you're trying to hear, you know, your music or you're trying to watch your movies or your television with the lean toward sonic accuracy this is not the speaker for you unfortunately because again a lot of bass boost a lot of high frequency very little mid-range dialogue clarity detail this just is not going to do that for you now if you need a set of cheap speakers for 150 bucks that you can walk about your place in and just have music in the background and you don't really care because you already know the words so you don't need to try to figure out what the artist is actually saying go ahead knock your socks off but if you want music for anything other than that, or if you want speakers for anything other than that purpose, I'm, I'm sorry to say it, avoid these speakers at all costs, no pun intended. So, you know what I've heard, I've kind of briefly glossed over that, because honestly, there's not a lot of sense in me getting into the deep details of, I listened to this particular song and it had this airy transient, I'm not doing that stuff with this speaker, it's just a bad speaker. But if you don't believe me, that's why I have measurement data. If you think measurement data is junk, I can tell you from experience that it's not. I have a very good track record of correlating what I hear with the data and I'll always listen first. I've been doing this stuff for well over a decade. So, you know, maybe I have a trained ear, but I'm willing to bet that if you had the opportunity to A, B, this speaker against a more neutral speaker, you would probably, statistically speaking, choose the neutral speaker. So I'm going to walk through some of the data. We're going to talk about what I heard or why I heard what I heard, and then we will be on our way. This is the CEA 2034 data set. And the main thing that you wanna take away from here is the black response. That's the on-axis response. If you fire the speaker right at your ear, lined up with the tweeter, this is what you're gonna hear. If I give you a song and you wanna reproduce that song, you can imagine that if you were to capture the frequency response of that song somehow, that the frequency response from the speaker versus the frequency response on the CD or on the disc or whatever you're listening to, they're gonna be the same, right? Because that's a straight A to A comparison. When you have anything that changes the response of what you have on the media in some way, form or another, then it's no longer A to B, you're getting further and further away from accuracy. Now, there are different levels of accuracy. Certainly preference comes along. 
If you prefer a speaker that has a lot of one note bass and a lot of high frequency, okay, maybe this is a speaker for you, but I gotta imagine that realistically speaking, you're probably wanting something that's gonna be a little bit more accurate. And what we see here in this data is evidence that this speaker is very non-accurate. The average sensitivity of the speaker is about 81 dB, so whatever the specs say, if it doesn't say 81 dB, then it is incorrect. It could be that they're using the high frequency area to pick the frequency response sensitivity, but 81 dB is about the average through the mid range from 300 Hertz to three kilohertz. If you take 81 dB and just kind of draw an imaginary line through here, you can see that the base is about plus five dB to between 80 Hertz and 100 Hertz. So there's that resonant boomy. And then if we go above that, you go into the high frequency, you're about five dB above that median mid range level. That's gonna sound and and all sorts of you know those cars that drop past you in the traffic and they go that's going to be the speaker in a nutshell the other thing that we want to pay attention to because we're going to talk about it later is the early reflections directivity response or index and that's this dash blue line down here this dash blue line should be either flat or have some kind of linear slope to it anytime it deviates from a line shape we're going to talk about that in a little bit this is the estimated in room response this comes from taking all of the data all the way around the speaker to the sides and up and down and trying to say, okay, well, in a typical room, this is how the sound is going to be. The timbre, the overall tonality, not sound stage, but the overall timbre and tonality of the speaker itself. And if I draw a trend line, which is very helpful to give us an idea, you compare the mid range to the high frequency. And again, what we're seeing is a bump here in the low end, and then a really significant bump in the high frequency area. For this speaker to have a dome tweeter in a relatively shallow waveguide, the soundstage width is probably about, I guess, where maybe you would expect, but I would think it might be a little bit wider. We're really barely scraping the surface of about plus or minus 50 degrees, so it's gonna be on the narrow side of things, not super narrow, but it's not gonna be very wide and spacious sounding. In terms of vertical performance, if you go above or below this tweeter too much, it's gonna sound like hot garbage. At best, you can maybe go above the tweeter about 10 degrees, maybe sit above a little bit, but you can't really go below that tweeter line. So if you're trying to put these in a multi-channel home theater system, keep that in mind. In terms of distortion, 86 dB. Now, if we go to 96 dB, we can see that the distortion overall trends upward, but honestly, I'm not seeing anything that makes me go, oh my gosh, this is terrible. This is kind of what I expect for a five inch midwoofer in this price class, especially. But then we talk about compression. So compression is the dynamic range of the speaker. That is the ability of the speaker to play at a given volume. So maybe 76 dB in this case. And now you've got a dynamic transient of 10 dB. Well, that would be represented by this red line. Ideally, this red line will be flat. That means there is no change in the response as you go from 76 dB to 86 dB. But we can see a little bit of a variance. It's below half a dB, so I'm okay with that. But if you go from 76 dB to 96 dB, now you're losing about a dB and more in the bass down here. That means you're losing dynamic range of the speaker. Definitely use a crossover. If you go from 76 dB to 102 dB, represented by this purple, you lose so much output in the lower mid-range and upper mid-bass area that this speaker would absolutely need a crossover to not suffer these issues. Now we have the multi-tone distortion test, which is distortion at varying volume across an entire 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz span. I use what is kind of similar to like pink noise because it emulates music. It's a lot better for you to test than with just harmonic distortion because it really tells you when you're gonna start running into problems. Now, personally speaking, I've drawn a line here at negative 20 dB, and that line represents about 10% distortion. For multi-tone distortion, I can always hear graininess and harshness in the mid-range when distortion is increased above this negative 20 dB line. In other words, as soon as I'm looking in this area, that's bad news. But this is pretty high output volume. This is about 90 dB or so at four meters away. So again, it's on the higher end of things, what happens when you use a crossover? Well, you can see that you drop down. So I'm only playing from 80 Hertz to 20 kilohertz in this particular test. Lessening the output on the very low end by using a crossover will help fix some of that mid-range distortion. All right, now we're gonna go back to, but Aaron, I can just EQ at 150 bucks, who cares? Well, one thing, do you know that your receiver is gonna be able to equalize this speaker in an ideal manner? Ideally meaning that I have taken the anechoic data, I have smoothed and flattened the on-axis response. 
what are the odds that your receiver can do that exact same thing? For me to do that, I use the Mini DSP 2x4 HD. And you can see the settings that I used right here. So if you want to copy those and use them on your own, knock yourself out. That's exactly the reason that I provide it. If the speaker has good directivity index, which we talked about, and that's that blue line down here, then it will take well to EQ. But whenever you see a deviation from a linear response, so let's say this slope kept going on up. Well, you've got a deviation right here. Then things flatten out and become more linear through here. So basically, in this region right through here, you're not going to be able to EQ this speaker very well. And we see the evidence of that here. Right now, what I'm showing you is the estimated interim response with and without EQ. Without EQ is in black, so you've seen this black line before. Same thing I showed you earlier. With EQ is this blue line, so this is the new thing. Now notice, you don't have this big bass boost anymore. I EQ'd that out. Mid-range still looks pretty smooth through here, so not really big issues right in that problem area. Mid-range still looks okay. And then when you get down here, hey, it's not a big jump right at the same spot, but unfortunately it is a big jump at four kilohertz. This is the area where EQ cannot fix the issue. So you can EQ as much as you want. This speaker will still not take well to EQ in this particular area because the directivity index is telling us there's a mismatch in continuity between the five inch midwoofer and the tweeter. So as the five inch is narrowing in response as it goes out into the room and gets higher in frequency, then the tweeter comes in and the tweeter is wide open, right? So you've got a lot more energy off the tweeter than you do off the mid range in about this two to five kilohertz area. So the mid range is gonna sound hot. The treble is gonna sound hot. It's gonna sound sharp. It's gonna come at you, probably thump you in the nose, maybe pull your eyelids. I don't know, but you're gonna notice it. So even with EQ, you still have that effect. Now you're probably thinking, okay, well, what else can I buy for 150 bucks, Aaron? I mean, really, what else is there? You say these speakers are garbage. Will you show me something else? Okay, I'll show you something else. We've got the Numi BS5. This is a passive speaker. It's about 110 bucks for the pair through Amazon. I've reviewed it. I like it. It's not perfect, but it's better than this Jamo S803. Also, the Sony SSCS5. This sucker bounces around. I paid 80 bucks for the pair to test them. I've seen them as much as 180, but they're in that same ballpark. Keep an eye out for them. To sum it all up, if you own these speakers and you're thinking, you have no idea what you're talking about because I own these speakers and they're great. If you were to compare this speaker to a true neutral speaker, I'm willing to bet that you're gonna like the neutral speaker. And even if you like a little bit more high frequency content, use your EQ, bump up that high frequency content because we've already seen that you can't use EQ to fix the problem areas in this speaker. Yeah, you can certainly smooth it out, but you're still gonna have an issue with the radiation as you go from narrow to very wide as you hand off from the midwoofer to the tweeter. And you're gonna hear that, that's gonna stand out to you. It's gonna, it's gonna just reach out and grab your earlobes and shake them a little bit and then probably do like this. You're not gonna like it. I, I can almost guarantee you you're not gonna like that. Again, maybe you own these, maybe you enjoy them, but I do recommend that you take the opportunity if you can to try something that has a more neutral sound. And if you don't like whatever it is, then send them back, that's fine. The cool thing about the data is that if you really truly like these speakers, now you've got the data and you can understand why and you can keep an eye out for other speakers that perform in a similar manner to how these perform. And then you can use that to buy speakers that you know that you're probably gonna like. Takes the risk out of it. So it's a win-win either way. If you don't believe me, just look at the data. With that said, I'm done with this review. I hope you appreciate it. I actually pay for these speakers myself with funds from Patreon, uh, donation through PayPal and affiliate links. So I'll drop a few generic affiliate links below that's what helps me run this channel and order all the stuff without coming too much out of pocket and hopefully never out of pocket. I do want to thank all my patrons. I want to thank you for watching. If you haven't already subscribed, please consider subscribing. That would be really cool. Leave me a thumbs up because that helps with the YouTube algos, even though they want me to do one minute shorts. I just don't really want to do that. I just feel weird doing that because I feel like I'm almost a 40 year old man trying to be cool. How do you do fellow kids? I'm not that hip. I don't know. I'm the closest thing to hip. I am is probably getting hip surgery at this point be honest with you. So anyway, I will talk to you all later. Take care. Peace.